Right, so let's take a look at a numerical example then for activity-based costing. So let's have a look at the information that we have here. So what we're told is we have a company that uses activity-based costing and they do that to calculate the unit cost of its products. Okay, so we produce a range of different products and we're trying to work out actually what does it cost us in terms of the overhead cost per unit to produce these particular products. Now we get some information, so it says the information relates to the expected figures for one particular activity, which is the supplier ordering costs over the next period. So what we're told is the supplier ordering costs are $171,000. Okay, so we've estimated that supplier ordering costs for the next period will be $171,000. Now we produce two different products. We've got product A and product B, and we're expected to make 80,000 units of both products over the next period. Now we produce these products in different batch sizes. So product A is produced in smaller batches. So that's produced in batches of 400 units. So it means every time we make a batch of product A, we make 400 units each time. Product B is produced in larger batches. So it's produced in batches of 1,000 units. Now we're also told that we have to place supply orders every time we make a batch. And that makes sense because if we're going to make a batch of products, we'd have to order our materials. And so we have to place one supplier order for every batch of product A produced. So maybe it's the case that actually we only need maybe one sort of type of material or component. So every time we make a batch of product A, we order from that one supplier. But product B maybe is a bit more complex in terms of the materials or components that we use because we have to place two supplier orders per batch every time we produce a batch of product B. Now what we're asked to work out, we've always got to read the question carefully, is what is the supplier ordering cost per unit of product B rounded to two decimal places? And we've got a range of different options, A through to D. Now, we know where we want to get to, but we've got to go through a number of steps in order to get there. Now, what we're trying to do is to say, right, well, every time we make a product B, and we're talking here about the activity of supplier ordering costs, what is the cost for one unit of product B in terms of supplier ordering costs? That's going to be quite difficult to work out because obviously we've got loads of supplier ordering going on. We produce two different products, so we've got to break it down step by step. Now, what we're looking to do overall here is we're trying to, first of all, work out what we would call a cost driver rate. And once we've got that, we can then work through some different steps and start working out overall, OK, what's the supplier ordering cost for a unit of product B? So let's have a look at how we do that. So to work out our cost driver rate, what we're going to want is our total supplier ordering costs, which we know. But also we then need to know our total number of supplier orders because what we want to work out is a cost for one order. And this is referred to, as it says, as the cost driver rate. Now, in order to do that, we've got a few steps to do first. Now, what we are told is the number of supplier orders per batch of each product. So what's going to be useful, first of all, is to work out how many batches of the products will be produced over the course of the period. Now, product A is produced in batches of 400 units. Now, if we're going to make 80,000 units in the period, as the question states, that means at 400 units per time, we're going to end up making 200 batches. Now, product B, of course, is produced in larger batches. It's produced in batches of 1,000 units. So if we're going to make 80,000 units in the period, 1,000 units in each batch, nice and simple, that one's going to be 80 batches. So in total, we've got 280 batches across the different product lines. Now, then we're a little bit closer to working out our total number of supplier orders because we know how many orders we place for each batch of the two products. And that's our next step. Now, we are told we place one supplier order for every batch of product A produced. Well, if we're going to make 200 batches of A, that's going to be in total 200 supplier orders. Now, we place two supplier orders for every batch of product B. Now, we're going to make 80 batches over the next period, according to the figures which are provided. So at two orders per batch, that would be 160 supplier orders. And we're getting closer. So now we can work out our cost driver rate because we've got our total supplier ordering cost because that was just provided to us. That was 171,000. 
And now we know across production of both product lines, we're going to make 200 plus 160, so 360 supplier orders. Now that works out an average cost of 475 per supplier order. So what we're really saying is on average, it costs us 475 to make or place a supplier order. Now we could then use that now this question is focusing on product B, but we could also do this for product A if we wanted to, to start to charge, if you like, our supplier ordering costs to our product lines. Now remember what we want to work out here is a cost for one unit of product B. And there's a couple of different ways we can go about this, but the easiest way is to first of all work out, based on that cost driver rate, what would be the total supplier ordering costs, which we would charge, if you like, to the production of all the product Bs. Well, what we do know is in total, we're going to have to place 160 supplier orders to make all the product Bs that will be produced. And the cost we've just worked out is 475 per order. So that will give us total supplier ordering costs, which we're going to charge, allocate if you like, to product line B of 76,000. And we're almost there. Now, if we know the total supplier ordering costs are 76,000, we can then finally say, right, what's it going to cost for one unit of product B? Well, we know in total in that period, we're going to make 80,000 units. So we can take that 76,000, divide it by the 80,000 units that we think are going to be produced, and that will arrive at the figure of 0.95 per unit. And therefore, that would give us the correct answer being answer A. So you can see there it's a step-by-step -step approach, particularly if you're working down to the cost for one unit of a product, you've got to think to yourself, I need a cost driver rate. Then you're just working your way towards getting the figures which allow you to calculate that cost driver rate. The ABC hierarchy was something that was put forward by Kaplan and Cooper in the early 1990s. Now, in particular, Kaplan, uh, you may have heard of before if you've come across the balance scorecard, because the balance scorecard was an idea put forward by Kaplan and Norton, so this is the same Kaplan. Uh, but Kaplan and Cooper are uh, basically esteemed academics and management consultants, and they suggested that actually what we could do as far as the activities and associated cost drivers are concerned for a business is we could classify them in one of four ways. Now, this would be very, very useful for businesses when they're trying to determine what the cost driver is is for a particular activity within their business. Now remember, cost driver, well cost driver is the reason we consume resources as far as a particular activity is concerned. So it's a reason really why we spend money as far as that particular activity is concerned within our business. Uh, so there are four different sort of levels to the hierarchy uh, and really it depends on what goes on as far as that particular activity is concerned as to the classification it would receive. So let's have a look at the different classifications that we have. So first of all, Kaplan and Cooper suggested that some of our cost drivers uh, would be what we call unit level activities, or some of our activities would be unit level activities, and therefore the cost driver, if you like, would be the number of units produced. Now, if you think about a manufacturing business once again, because it's the easiest way really to sort of uh, represent these things, is things that would be a unit level activity would be things such as our direct costs. Now, we generally don't think about direct costs when we're talking about uh, activity-based costing because it tends to focus on the overheads, but direct costs would be an example of a unit level activity because the idea is these costs would increase, more resources are consumed every time an additional unit is produced. So for example, if we're making a product, every time we make an additional unit, we buy some more materials, we'd have to incur some more labor costs. And so therefore, unit level activities are the ones where more resources are consumed each time an additional unit is produced. So example being direct costs, but could also be some other overheads, which is where ABC more traditionally focuses, which would be, if you like, variable overheads. So the ones that rise as we produce each additional unit. 
We then have batch level activities. Now batch level activities, well an appropriate cost drive of batch level activities would be the number of batches produced. So it's the idea here that we consume more resources, we spend more costs every time we produce a batch of products. Now remember what a batch of products is, it's when we produce a bulk amount of items at the same time. So we might be producing 500 units of product X in each batch. Now, typical examples of batch level activities would be things like supplier ordering costs. Okay, so every time we produce a batch of products, we'd have to place an order with our suppliers. But we've also got one there on screen, which is equipment setup costs. When we produce a batch of products, we have to get our production machinery ready to produce that batch of products. And they will be set up each time we're making a new batch. And so therefore, for these particular activities, the cost driver would be the number of batches produced. We then have what we call either products, or if we're talking about a non-manufacturing business, service sustaining activities. And so therefore, these are particular activities whereby we consume more resources, if you like, as far as a particular product line is concerned. So the idea would be these things would only kick into action maybe when we launch or start to produce a new product. And so a good example there of a product sustaining level activity would be something like product launch costs, or maybe even something if we're thinking about the non-manufacturing environment, maybe something like research and development costs. So these are things which are specific to a particular product line, and these are things that really kick into action when we decide, if we're talking about a manufacturing business, to produce and launch a new product. Okay, so are they specific to a particular product line? We could say they are product or service level sustaining activities. And then finally, we have our facility sustaining activities. And these really are just the general sort of fixed costs, if you like, of a business. These are ones which we can't relate on a unit level, a batch level, or indeed a product level. These are just general overheads of the business. So a good thing to think about is, right, have I gone through that list? Is it unit level? No. Is it batch level? No. Is it product sustaining? No. Well, chances are then it is a facility sustaining activity. These are just general costs of the business, which can't be related to any particular area. So like I say, the ABC hierarchy is a useful way to think about different activities and what their associated cost drivers would be. Now, if we're going to compare and contrast activity-based costing with traditional absorption costing, depending on where our activities sit within the hierarchy will determine the difference we get when we work out the overhead cost per unit for the products, in this case, if we're talking about manufacturing business, being produced by the organization. Now, what we'll find is ABC and absorption costing treat unit level costs and facility sustaining costs in the same way. So if we're looking at absorption costs and our activity based costing, if we've got unit level costs, they really are just variable costs of the business. And the vast majority of them would be direct costs, such as your direct materials and your direct labor. Will they be treated in exactly the same way using absorption costing or activity based costing? So if most of our activities were unit level there wouldn't be a huge difference in the cost we calculated using either approach, ABC or absorption costing. Likewise, if most of our overheads were facility sustaining, then that would mean that actually the vast majority of our overheads are just fixed costs. Now, again, if they're just fixed costs, really, if we used ABC or absorption costing, we wouldn't see a big difference because it'd end up having a very, very similar impact on the production costs when we think about the overheads as far as the products are concerned. So there wouldn't be a huge difference there. Now, what we are going to see is going to be a big, big difference if we have a lot of what we would call batch level or product sustaining level activities within our organization. Because what traditional absorption costing does, outside things like your direct costs, so your variable costs, uh, such as your direct materials and your direct labor, it kind of treats everything else as fixed. However, under activity-based costing, if we've got a lot of batch level and product sustaining level style activities, then actually they're not going to be treated as fixed under activity-based costing. What we're going to do is we're going to go through that process that we've seen. We're going to identify uh, activities, associated cost drivers, and therefore what we're really doing is treating them in some way as certainly non-fixed costs, we're not going to call them variable costs because that's not the correct definition of them, but we're essentially saying actually 
the cost drivers and the instance of these over a period will influence what these costs will be over a period of time. So the more batch level or product or service sustaining level cost that we have, as far as our particular business is concerned, the bigger the differential between the cost we'd arrive at using ABC and absorption costing. Let's take a look at an example then, which uh, gets us to classify certain costs within the business according to the ABC hierarchy. So let's have a look at what we've got here. So the question says, when using the ABC hierarchy, what would be the correct classification for the following costs? So we've got product design costs. We've got production equipment maintenance costs. We've got some admin costs. And we've got some material movement costs. Now, product design costs, nice and simple. Product design costs, when we're thinking about bringing out a new product, we'd have to spend money designing a product, building a prototype, and so on and so forth. We've got production equipment maintenance costs. So obviously if we use equipment to produce our products over time due to wear and tear, we'll then have to spend some money maintaining the equipment so it uh, maintains its operational sort of efficiency and productivity. Admin costs, obviously general admin costs of the business. The material movement costs, if you've not come across this before, what happens in a manufacturing business is they place orders with their suppliers and their materials arrive at the business premises and they're often kept in what's called a warehouse or a stores department. And then they are moved onto the factory floor as and when they are required for production. So the material movement cost is that activity within the business which moves the material from the warehouse onto the production floor so it's ready to be used in production. Now, we've got a range of different options. Now, remember, under the activity-based costing hierarchy, we can either have a unit level cost, we can have a batch level cost, we can have a product sustaining level cost, or a facility sustaining level cost. So let's have a look at what we've got here. So first of all, our product design costs. Well, as far as these are concerned, product design costs are only going to kick in when we're looking to launch a new product. It's actually something that's specific to a particular product line. If we are looking to design product X, the money we spend designing product X is specific to product line X. It's not related to any other products that the business produces. So actually the most appropriate classification according to the ABC hierarchy there will be a product sustaining level activity. Now the next one, you could maybe argue this either way, but actually production equipment maintenance costs would generally be classified as a unit level activity. Now the idea here being that the more units we produce on a particular piece of equipment, the more wear and tear that piece of equipment will be exposed to. If we produce one unit on a piece of equipment, that will barely impact its operational efficiency. But every time we produce an additional unit, it's exposed to more wear and tear. And therefore, when we do spend money on the maintenance costs, it's going to increase the maintenance costs. So actually, we'd usually classify production equipment maintenance costs as a unit level activity. The more units we produce, the more we're going to have to spend in this area maintaining the equipment. Admin costs is a reasonably straightforward one because you work your way through the hierarchy where it's not unit level, it's not batch level. It's certainly not a particular product sustaining level because admin costs are general costs that can't relate to one particular product line. And so you've probably guessed this one nice and easily. This is a facility sustaining level. Okay, It's just a general cost of the business. Now, material movement costs generally classified as batch level costs. So it's the idea that every time we're going to make a batch of products, we've got to move the material from stores to the factory floor. Therefore, it's ready for us to produce our products. And so actually, if we're going for product sustaining, unit level, facility sustaining, and batch level, that marries up to answer D.